welcome this afternoon uh, for a long-awaited discussion on a project that we've been discussing for a long time. Uh, we have today a collective of representatives of our joint boards of directors uh, of the uh, Chamber of Business and Industry family. We have uh, guests from the community, our, representing our legislative delegation, our friends from the city of Est, the congressman's office. Uh, we have some kind of River Landing Corporation represented. So we, you know, we have we have a good cross section of people here today to really talk about something. And, and I, you know, when I, I keep saying we're going to talk about things. I, I oftentimes think about the uh, the three most common lies, and I think I could be accused of of perpetrating uh, one of these. Uh, as you all know, that checks in the mail is the first lie. Uh, the second lie is I'll call you in the morning. And uh, the third, that this study will be done next month. Uh, and I've been saying this now for two and a half years. It's not the consultant's fault. Uh, what I'd like to do is just relate to you a little bit about uh, you know, why this is taking so long. Uh, this project has been evolving from the first day that we had a conversation about a, a landing or a location in this community for a, uh, as, as a terminus point of the Delaware and Lehigh Heritage Corridor. In early 1990, uh, the National Park Service was looking at establishing this, this corridor. And I was asked to go to the, the President's office over at Wilkes because the folks of the Park Service were there interviewing folks in the community about, about the corridor. Well, when I arrived at that session, we found out that the corridor was going to be terminated in White Haven. That it was going to run south from there, and that was going to be the final stop. So we proceeded to make a very strong case uh, for, for why it should be extended to Wilkesbury, or at least up to the upper end of Luzerne County, where the coal originated. It was all about shipping in the coal. And, uh, and then we got the congressman involved, and, and the state legislative delegation and others, and, and the Park Service uh, came around and included Wilkesbury as the terminus point uh, for the DNL corridor. Well, now that was not to be much more than a small tourist center where people would stop in and learn a little bit about the history of the community and why it's part of the corridor. And, and, and then it, over the years after that, it said it's blossomed. It, it next went to, uh, well, if we're going to do a, a small center here that's going to talk about the history of the community, why don't we talk about a museum? The Historic Society has been op operating under very modest conditions for many years, and this area has such a rich history that we ought to really take a look at, at really expanding the presence and trying to do something very significant uh, to tell the story before the story is totally lost, on, on, and particularly for the benefit of our future generations. So we started with, with the idea of the museum. We looked at the Iron Temple, we looked at other locations, and we'll hear more about that as we go along. Uh, but then we then we took a look uh, at at what was becoming even a more powerful uh, influence on where the community was headed, as the county started talking about the riverfront, and and the congressman talking about you know, the dam, and really creating a, a location along the, the riverfront uh, that we thought well, we got to start really maybe start talking about uh, you know enhancing that amenity and doing more. So uh, we went from there, uh, from the museum. Let's start talking about some other public assembly facilities. We uh, looked at a, a convention center as, as just another potential amenity. Uh, and you know, we looked at the convention center, the hotel, a whole series of things uh, collectively. And, and now what we have is, is potentially a very significant uh, you know, community changing sort of project. Now, that's, you're going to hear a lot more about this, the, the pros and the cons and the reasons why. But, uh, but I did want to just put that out there. We spent approximately $175,000 on studies that included uh, market feasibility studies, uh, architectural work, and other things in terms of analysis of the Iron Temple facility and, and others. And uh, we think it's been money well spent. And finally, uh, we get this program, before we get the program going, I, I just want to explain some of the terminology to you because one thing I found when we start talking about about the river landing project, a lot of people think the river landing is the riverfront. But we're 
attempting to do is create an address, which would be the river landing. The address perhaps could consist of a location. I'm not saying this is cast in any way. I'm just suggesting. Like most of the things we'll be talking about today are, are concepts and suggestions for us to ponder. Uh, that perhaps the, the block that, that extends from Market Street to Union Street could be the river landing address. And so you might have the Sterling at the river landing. You might have a convention center at the river landing museum. So that if a tourist comes into town, you can say, go down to the river landing district and you'll get, you know, you'll see a lot of things. Uh, so, so the river landing is, is more of a concept of a development and an address. The river front is the water side uh, of, 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 of what the county is attempting to do. Uh, so there you have the docks, the promenade, the amphitheater, those sorts of things. The river commons is the land side of the park. So when you hear these terms used over the course of the, of the next uh, hour or so, uh, just you know, keep that in mind. Lastly, I'd like to ask uh, Larry Newman just to come forward and, and just briefly talk about the, uh, the project in terms of the context of what, we're, what we've attempted to do with this study in relation to our downtown and the river. So Larry? Thanks, Steve. I'm going to make this very fast uh, because I want to get to the report like everyone else does. But what I simply want to remind everyone is that this study does not exist in a vacuum. This is the latest step in what I would argue is a very deliberate series of steps that have been taken by the folks in this room participating in the uh, organizations that you've been participating in, really dating back to uh, those first downtown visioning sessions in 2001. Uh, when we sat together in uh, the ballrooms at Genetti's and the Ramada. Uh, we have developed a very thoughtful, I think, planning framework for downtown Wilkes-Barre, uh, one that is based in market reality. Uh, we have thrown, uh, you know, and we've gotten a number of the projects now that were once just dreams on paper are now rapidly coming to fruition from the Innovation Center on South Main Street. Now the theater project is starting to take shape in a tangible and very visible way. Um, the Sterling is now at the point where, as, as we all know, uh, CityVest is, is ready to move forward with that. You've all seen the, the exciting drawings there. And the riverfront, uh, so importantly, is, is coming to fruition. Uh, now it's time to start taking the next steps to start thinking about how to build on the first series of projects, start getting uh, the next series of projects in the pipeline so that we can really begin to fulfill the expectations that were set when we, when we started initiating this planning uh, several years ago. Um, I want to introduce uh, and many of you know them already, uh, the consultant team who's going to be presenting to you today uh, from Mary Means and Associates, Mary Means, uh, from Economic Stewardship, Elaine Carmichael, uh, and from Bolin Sowinski Jackson, uh, Jim Bell. Uh, this group has been working with us, uh, as Steve said, for quite some time. Uh, the uh, parameters of this project have changed, but uh, quite honestly, that's what feasibility studies are all about. And uh, I think we're looking forward now to continuing the conversation. But again, I think as they start to go through this, I'm hoping that all of you will start to see how the various pieces of this puzzle, particularly on the riverfront, but also throughout downtown, from the college campuses to what's happening on South Main Street, can start to come together and start getting knitted together. So with that, uh, Mary and Elaine. Thank you, Larry. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Elaine. Um, I'm remembering that when we kicked this um, exciting project off, um, it was in July several years ago, and Steve asked me, uh, our firm is in Alexandria, Virginia, where all of, we travel a lot and all of that, and, 
And we do a lot of work with downtowns, with places that have a lot of history. We work an awful lot with Elaine Carmichael from Economic Stewardship because she's got uh, a tremendous amount of integrity and an enormous brain and a great deal of experience dealing with, um, I want to say, the, the economic consequences of leisure activity and how to harness that for economic development reasons. But she also comes into things from uh, a very seasoned background in routine feasibility ana of analysis for any, any kind of project just about um, out there from e industrial and economic development to museums and theme parks. The only person that could ever have talked me into sitting in the first car on the trail ride was Elaine once. She couldn't talk me into doing it twice, I don't think. But I guess my point is that when we, when we looked at this, um, and Steve said he wanted to kick it off with something special that would get everybody to really turn out us foolishly. Why don't we do it on the um, stage of the Iron itself and invite everybody to come and be on stage? How many of you were there on that 100 degree day with no air conditioning? And you came back today, I'm amazed. Um, so when he said today, where should we do this? I went anywhere but the Iron on 100 degree day. But at any rate, what we were first asked to do was, um, there have been some ideas kicking around, as, as Steve said, um, around a, a, a museum of, about history, because you felt you had a great deal of it. Science, a lot of interest around um, science museums and kids and, and, and children's museums and all. Art, there are some fairly significant contemporary art collections around here. And then there's the Iron Building. So over here are some program ideas. Here's a building whose need and its, its, its use has changed. It's an important building, important memories for everyone there. Could we accommodate those? So our group, which at the time included also uh, Shomer Zwelling, who many of you met. met uh, Shomer is probably one of the nation's uh, best interpretive planners of taking history and science and complicated ideas and finding ways of presenting programs and exhibits and things that, that touch people emotionally and therefore enable them to learn easily and to enjoy it at the same time. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington is a project that he was uh, at some of the same stage he, he was working here. He's trying to kind of take all this and make it into something. So we worked for a goodly while, met many of you in interviews and looked at the stuff. Our major questions were, have you got the goods, i.e. the story, the, the artifacts and things, to do some of these facilities? Do you have the people? Do you have the leadership? Is the community really fired up and behind it? Uh, and will it all work in a, in a building like the Iron? Um, what we concluded after a short period of time is you do indeed have very powerful stories. Uh, stories that are not being well presented to yourselves or to anyone else. Um, and that there are great educational potential for a lot of them all. We also learned that there are some really wonderful people here, civic leaders and philanthropic uh, community and all of that, but that the organizations to take forward, starting a new science museum or a new history museum, uh, that was going to need some work. And most importantly, we learned and concluded that the Iron Hall is a wonderful building built for public assembly. It was just not going to be right to do the kind of alterations to it that would be necessary to convert it into uh, museum facilities. And along a parallel, sort of parallel course with it um, uh, was this emerging sense of other things that might happen. CityVest was finally uh, taking ownership of the sterling. Things were beginning to happen, and a lot of ideas were beginning to generate. At this point, we were asked to add on to exploring the feasibility, the market and economic feasibility, of, of potentially having a, a convention or meeting facility here. Um, and then throwing that into the mix on this block that Steve's described. So what would that do to the rest of the ideas and where might some of the ideas uh, move? You would think that I would start out logically with uh, the presentation being about the cultural facility and then the uh, potential convention center. But we wanted for you to sort of cut to the end, and then I'm going to come back on after Elaine takes us through uh, the, uh, the thinking that has gone into the work on a potential convention center here. And I'll be back, coming back and resume conversation about um, some aspects of the cultural facility. So I'd like to introduce my colleague, Elaine Carmichael, uh, who is going to take it from here. Good Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. 
how quickly they learn. The, um, thank you for coming here today. Um, it's, I've been looking forward to this day for uh, too long, too long. But um, but it's good to be here, and it's been as as um, either Steve or Larry said, it's been worth the wait. What we've been doing is really taking charge of several steps of what is always an iterative process. There's always a part where citizens and organizations get together and decide, we have an idea that looks like it's going to be worth testing. And then the actual testing occurs and it becomes to the point where we are now. Of, this looks good enough to take out to the public, to the leadership, and find out what they think and whether or not it's worth pursuing. But all of this is always a level of detail issue. As you know, if any of you have ever attempted a renovation project on your, on your house up to the size of anything, including um, arenas and stadiums and convention centers, um, the more you delve into it, the more detail, um, the more you revise your previous assumptions, the better understanding of things that you get. We're at that preliminary stage where it, it's good enough to look out to the community with it and say, hey, um, is this worth pursuing? Is it something that you all collectively want to decide if it's something that you want for your community and if you're willing to step up and take those further exploratory steps into figuring out how to make it happen? So with that, um, uh, this briefing agenda will hopefully be fairly brief. We want to leave time for presentation at the end and talk about next steps. Um, we'll be talking about why reinvesting downtown today makes sense, what all these potential additional uses are, um, and how they work with each other and individually as separate but discrete entities, and what the benefits to the community are that arise from it. Um, as both Larry and Steve and Mary have talked about, we came to this knowing that there were some Susquehanna landing elements already in place that looked good, and that to collectively together, they hopefully have the potential to catalyze other investments, including the ones that are the major focus of our presentation here today. The Riverfront Park, benefiting from extensive flood control funding through the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, you'll recall that part of the negotiation on the design of that involved the placement of portals to enable the public to get back and forth across through the levee to have access to the riverfront itself. And that that in turn entails quite a few streetscape improvements for North and South River boulevards, North and South River streets, which are about to become boulevards. That um, levee portal issue is going to come back because that plays a key role in the orientation of uh, the convention center to help people who are using the convention center take access and enjoyment from the riverfront park too. The parking garage, as you can see, we intend this parking garage to be around for quite some time. Um, funding is underway for that parking garage, coming from a variety of state, federal, and other sources. And all along, this parking garage has been thought of as being a shared infrastructure resource for many different uses, for recreational users to the waterfront, uh, for people shopping downtown, and as another piece of infrastructure investment to help offset some of the parking deficits that um, are currently in, in place in the town. The Sterling Hotel, the City Bus Project, um, which right now uh, we're working on assumptions that it will be about 45 upscale units and um, quite a significant number of uh, retail and restaurant operations within, some also in condominium locations, some not. Altogether totaling approximately 22 million, of which eight is identified and some partners are in place. Um, so the block we're talking about here, this is the first of the cheesy PowerPoint presentations because it wouldn't be a consulting presentation without it. The block we're talking about is right up there, bound by North River Street, Union Street, North Franklin Street, and Martin Street. You all know the block. And our context for development, therefore, is that great proximity to the public square um, within the two or three minute block. Um, the historic buildings of districts, which on this graphic are shown, the purple are um, buildings on historic register, this yellow boundary is the historic district itself, so we're smack in there. And the um, close access to markets available from both Wilkes and King's College, which in our view is a, um, an undertapped resource that has a lot of uh, potential to deliver dollars to them in Wilkesburg. There's a lot of architectural gems on this site that need some tender on the care. Um, the Iron Temple is one of them, the Sterling Axe is another, we'll be talking about that later. But there's a whole host of historic buildings up and down River Street that, um, if given the impetus to do so, could carry additional investment that would make them more of a character benefit um, for the community as a whole. But you've got a lot of momentum going on downtown right now. Um, the cinema, other reinvestment, um, improvements that are being made to the streetscape, it's a good time to sort of capture that reinvigoration and that, and that new spirit. 
because I think people are getting more excited about their tabs happening. And part of what we found when we were talking to people was that sort of interest and excitement. And who have we been talking to? There's a lot of students at downtown, um, the Chamber of Commerce, of course, has been um, our key contact, both through the Board of Directors and uh, the Susquehanna Land Corporation. Um, Diamond City Partnership, a key player, also City Vest, um, the city, the county, um, lots of help from many state and federal representatives that have met with us and have pledged to try and help secure funding, um, and all of the local colleges and universities. Looking at this as a catalyst, what we were trying to find out is what sort of new markets were going to be attracted to the area from, those, uh, from the improvements of um, the Susquehanna Landing that are already in place, and looking at the fact that there's more residential development coming down, that there's going to be more people and they're probably going to be a little bit better healed um, downtown to take advantage of. Knowing that that garage is going in also raises implications because a garage is a big complicated structure. They're, um, they're bulky, um, they're dark, and they're heavy. Um, and as much as we need it, it's going to, that's a really important block to have a big garage on. So we also started thinking, okay, what can we take, how can we take advantage of this garage, but maybe also how can we camouflage it? Um, so we started looking for uses that would benefit from that market support and all that cross fertilization between the different kinds of folks who are going to take advantage of these places and serve to draw additional people downtown while being consistent both from a character standpoint and from a use standpoint and continue to leverage that investment for the community. So that led us to looking at a public assembly facility, you can't have a public assembly, assembly facility without hotel space, trying to figure out what to do with the Iron Temple in the context of that, and then working on this discovery next center notion that we got a, um, initial uh, suggestions and ideas from, from the Delaware Architect Networks. What did we do to test the feasibility? We tried very hard to, um, to hold two ideas in our heads simultaneously. One was that each of these entities had to work independently. And the other was, the reality is they're not independent. There's a lot of possible benefits. They, they can share parking. Um, they can share responsibility and revenues from servicing of events. There's huge overlaps in the market. Those uses were picked for that very purpose. So what we had to do was kind of parse that, parse that interrelationship, making sure that they function separately from the economic standpoint um, without ignoring or conversely without exaggerating the synergistic effects. We looked at um, the health of Jim Bell. We looked at um, how the site worked. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, develop some preliminary concepts and, and uh, building programs, square footages, different kinds of uses, that sort of thing. Figured out on uh, a very general level what it would cost, uh, not only the construction, but all the other pre development costs that go with it, and then started running performance to figure out whether it made sense and what the influence of different financing and managing options might be. So here's the site. And we've got the, the buildings existing in place, the Sterling Hotel in the corner, the annex next door, the Iron Temple. The convention center going here is what this um, drawing is a, is a big green log. The hotel over there, so that it can take advantage of the views to the river. This here is anticipated to be another city that's private development, um, actual composition unknown at this point. The parking, which here is conveniently available to everything, so that it can be shared by all, and it is essentially tucked, for the most part, to the interior of the block, so it's not dominating the presence. Um, and I should say, by the way, that all of these graphics by BCJ are to show one option for how it might work and to prove that physically all things can fit. But none of this is carved in stone yet or built of stone. Circulation systems, which in this graphic are shown in the blue-gray, this is a um, this is envisioned as a, as a glass tunnel connecting all of the elements so that you can move freely from the, um, the Sterling Annex here to the parking, the new development, the hotel, and the convention center itself. As well as the and then this portal, which is the access to the riverfront park. So why aspire to a convention center? Um, we're going to be talking about that and, and as well the state of the industry today because it's in flux. As many of you probably know, um, a lot of convention centers have been developed in the, in the last decade or so. There's been an awful lot of cities that have said, hey, we want one too. Some of them have been wiser than others in terms of what they've chosen to build. And that relates in turn to what Wilkes-Barre's competitive position is. What other cities, if you take this 
um, an opportunity with other cities which you'd be competing against and so forth. And what does that suggest about the size facility that you can and should seek to have here? In turn, what does that cost? What kind of performance does that entail? And what other factors might affect the success, including management options that, that, that are available to you? Cities pursue convention centers essentially for the indirect benefits. They're looking to the spending that delegates and exhibitors make, um, the tax revenues off of that. And um, this next one, which is underappreciated, is that any kind of visitor group, but particularly a business visitor group, is adding a sliver of market support to the kinds of uses that make this place more livable for residents. So um, perhaps by example, I did a study on this once in San Francisco, where it turned out that the visitor population was only like 10 or 15 percent of the restaurant market support, but they were the crucial 10 or 15 percent that allowed there to be hundreds of restaurants and you know 50 different ethnicities and all this very good place that contributed to why people wanted to live in San Francisco, why they wanted to locate their companies there, why they viewed it as a world-class city. And had those visitors not been there, that array of choice and that array of positive quality of life experience would not have been available. So that's what I mean here by that gap market silver. Exposure to the rest of the world, including people who make business location decisions. Um, more reasons to go downtown for the folks who live here. And therefore, more reason for them to spend money downtown. And that's to the benefit of the region, because a strong downtown, a strong downtown, makes the region, the region as a whole um, a better place to be. So for Wilkesbury, one of the great things that you all have going for you is that you've already made some major investments in the kind of infrastructure uses that would support this. The arena is key. Um, first of all, it's, it's, it's a lot of proof of concept, even though it's a slightly different form. It, it's a very different form of public assembly use. Um, the fact that your community has a use of memory, had the experience of building it, is not to be seen that. Um, because the community is experienced with the level of commitment and patience and timing um, for that to, to happen, and because it's been a success in place. Um, the Kirby Center for the Performing Arts is another thing that's a, a, a very useful uh, use for you all to already have in place, because what both of those mean is that you can compete for meetings and conventions and so forth that need those kinds of spaces without actually having to build them because they're already available within the market. Um, and here in the community, you don't have that many flat floor options of any size, um, not over 18,000 square feet. The college facilities that are here, this is a lovely, this is a lovely place, um, but you'd be hard pressed to put any kind of major event in here of the sort that we're talking about. This is a different scale facility than um, the kind of convention center we're, 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 we're thinking about here. And you have quite a small downtown hotel inventory. Um, with the Ramada and Genetics are advantageous to us to have because they provide choice, but in and of themselves, they are not enough rooms to really sustain this kind of operation. And they don't have an awful lot of meeting space themselves either. Because what we're looking at is a bunch of different kinds of uses. We're looking at a facility that has the flexibility to have regular conventions um, with their meeting room and ballroom needs, uh, but also assemblies, the kind that go in large exhibit halls or theaters and have out-of-town visitors, um, smaller meetings, uh, conferences that are speaking to a regional trade and a local trade, trade shows where it's largely from out of town, um, and consumer shows, which again contributes to quality of life and, and that avoided leakage. So in addition to the kind of general set of local and civic events that are part of the scene in any community, we're trying to imagine a space that working in conjunction with some of those other investments you've already made can do double and triple duty so that all of these different kinds of events can be accommodated. Because in talking to meeting planners, and the convention industry spends a lot of time surveying them, um, what is key to them is appropriate facilities. A lot of the cities out there that have gotten into trouble with their convention centers have gotten into trouble because they just kept building more and more giant spaces. And they were trying to get a couple of big shows that need you know, half a million square feet and up. But in reality, what people want is a place that is not too big and not too small, but just right for their needs and what they anticipate. It has to be accessible. Um, and it also has to be distinctive because what the meeting planners are really trying to do, they're making their money by getting their members to pay to come to the conference. And, um, or, the, or to be able to charge more to trade show booth holders because they're attracting an audience. So they need the place to motivate visitation. And you probably know from your own experience that you're more likely to go to an event that's in a um, 
So it's somewhere you want to visit, it's somewhere that's not. And the range of nearby hotels, where again, you all are already ahead. So this, um, as well as the other Susquehanna Landing investments, are making Wilkes-Barre more attractive by the, with every passing year as a place. Because getting back to that notion about bigger, not necessarily better, what this chart shows you is that the, the giant purple chunk here is 62% of trade shows, just trade shows, meaning under 100,000 square feet. So, I mean, the vast majority of the market, even though those, the, the biggest that need over 700,000 or 6 to 700,000, but if you see this, over half a million is only 5% of the total market, even though it's the one that gets all the attention and the one that gets all the big investments. What kind of space do, um, do meetings look to me? Again, it's the same thing, where 75% of it is under 100,000 square feet. It's counterintuitive. The kinds of events that actually sustain convention centers are not the ones you hear of. And if you look at the existence of um, the facilities that are in place right now, some of these are tired and so forth, but that more or less reflects it, that you've got quite a lot of small facilities out there, and not that many, um, the technical term for this would be biggins, not that many biggins that are over 300,000 square feet. And here are the numbers of attendees that go with that. And once again, what you've got is over 2,000 only being 14%. And the vast majority of them, um, about 75% being 1,000 or under. Which, sneaking ahead, can't be accommodated in the space that we're talking about. When you look at what meeting planners want versus what Wilkes Ferry has, it, it also looks good. Because basically, you've got all this stuff. You've got a lot of value stuff. You've got the, um, environmental amenities, the recreations coming in. Um, mandated by bylaws, you can't do anything about that. That's, um, but it's not as bad as it appears. Um, because there are quite a few organizations we'll be talking about who are mandated to meet in Pennsylvania. Um, this last one here, Glamour is a popular image of location. We're working on it. <laughs> there are challenges, and some of them are implied by that list. Um, there's the challenge of the air service. Not, it's kind of hard to get here, um, and, it, and when you do, it's kind of expensive quite a bit of the time. Uh, we've got this issue of not that many down, uh, not that many downtown hotels. Um, this plan is helping to cure that. We've got the limited convenient recreation opportunity situation. I can't tell you what a huge difference the river front will make in that, because it's the kind of, of recreational opportunity you can enjoy in the clothes that you bring to a convention. You can go out for a nice stroll, you can get some air, you can, it, it, it is absolutely it's scenically beautiful and well convenient at the same time, and then the downtown, which is improving by the minute. So who would you be competing with? You would not be competing with the Orlandos and, and Houston's and, and New Orleans's and, uh, and Las Vegas's of the world. You would be com competing with other inland Atlantic coast cities. Um, here in Pennsylvania, you'd be competing with the Lehigh Valley and places like, like Hershey. Um, you'd be competing probably with Binghamton. Um, you are, you can have these folks lunch. You really can. Because none of these facilities, you'd be competing with Lancaster, which is probably your biggest competition in the, in the, in the, in the immediate area. They have a new convention center going downtown, um, which is going to be lovely. Um, and then the last thing is you compete against the default choices of the 1,400 groups that are mandated to meet in Pennsylvania. Uh, because they're in a pattern. The good news is they haven't had that many places to go in this neck of the woods. And their pattern is, for many of them, is to move around the state to make it sequentially convenient for people. And they don't have a good option up here. You can be that option for all of them. So you need to know that demand for facilities is, is increasing, but also the competition is. That Altoona um, facility we talked about, that's only a couple of years old, the one that's coming into Lancaster. It's, um, there's still a lot of building in the sector going on. And so this opportunity is not infinite. That um, it is getting overbuilt. It is getting, you, you need to, if you're going to move on this, you need to be careful about it because you can't just expect that this is something you can do forever. Um, that there will be, by taking action here, you will, force, you will foresaw others from taking action. Um, and yet, there really isn't, you're, you, you would be the only game in town, essentially, in, in, in Northeast Pennsylvania. And for that reason, you might be able to get some nationals that had a thematic connection here. You might be able to get nationals that had a connection to some of your principal themes. 
um, some of your nature themes that are going to be explored in the um, cultural center in Salem. But we have to deal with the hotel availability. So what we're talking about here is 45 to 50,000 square feet in that green box, and plus the iron. And I'll talk about plus the iron in a minute. All of this would be infinitely divisible to get that flexibility. In, in, and that kind of space, with the largest exhibit hall being about 25,000 square feet, would accommodate about 100 to 150 tracer booths for about 1,700 to 2,000 people in the banquet facility. And that gets you, remembering back to those pie charts, that gets you into the vast majority of events. Um, and if you renovate the Art of Temple, there's a bunch of interesting advantages that come with that. So, here's how the site is, again, this is um, essentially, this is pretty much a view from BCJ, isn't it? Okay. Um, with the unknown future building here, but you can start seeing how these pieces get along with the temple and the convention center and the hotel. There's a reason for this, for this um, confluence of uses right there. And that is that to gain efficiency and cut capital costs and help on the feasibility side, we've made some key physical assumptions. We're putting the central kitchen in the hotel so that they essentially have a monopoly on, on the servicing of events and so that we don't have to build multiple huge kitchens. Um, putting a catering kitchen in the iron basement, because the iron basement makes a lot of sense for back of house use since this site is tight, how to fit everything in. And then using the discovery center for a lot of the pre-function space, because you can make this place distinctive, not only by offering events in the iron temple, which are gonna blow people's minds, but also that you have an interesting museum there. So there's a way for sub-events or corporate sponsored cocktail parties, all that kind of thing, to have something that's interesting and unusual and yet is in the same complex. So if you're coming from the region, you don't have to park twice, you can get there on your roof and so forth. So looking at it from the other side, the beauty of this scheme with the connecting corridor becomes clear because you can get to, to the museum here, you can get to the Iron Temple if you're using that space, you can get um, you can get all through from the hotel easily and then back into the apartment. The process for all of these uses was essentially the same. To look at their financial performance by thinking about what kind of fees the market could bear, creating hypothetical events calendars, again, based on the kinds of events that are out there, what sizes they are, how many people come, how long they stay, whether they want weekends or weekdays, and so forth. Figuring out how long the ramp up to stabilization takes because people don't want to wait around for, they don't want to guess and hope that your convention center will be done on time and they need to make these decisions several years in advance. So all these kinds of public assembly facilities have a ramp up time as people become more confident that it will actually be available in a good place. Um, for every single one of these uses, we made a range of alternatives. We looked at uh, small, medium, and large sizes. We looked at different use levels to try to recover the waterfront, basically. To try to look at the array to see what is the, because this is a, um, an early look in that, in that level of detail um, process that I spoke about earlier, we wanted to see, okay, in the whole array, does it only look good in one sliver of that, or does it look good in a wide enough segment of the option um, to carry on? We were also um, extremely careful to make sure that we accounted, we tried to exaggerate on the costs and underestimate on the revenues, if anything, we were conservative on, in both regards so that we were very careful to do things like hold reserve funds out in place and, and um, make sure that, that uh, all of that was anticipated. So with the convention center, what happens? It takes about three, three plus years to, to achieve a stabilized event calendar. Um, it will generate annual operating deficit of just that complex itself to the tune, depending on the scenario, of on the order of three to 500,000. Now, that is a scary number on the, on the front of it, but what you have to remember is where, the rev where so many of the revenues are realized. And it goes back to that reason why communities chase convention centers. They're seeing the revenues on the back end in the additional tax monies, in the collection of, of, of bed taxes if they have them, and car rental taxes, and all that kind of stuff, and the exposure to other people. Um, and operating a deficit of this level is a, is a normal and usual thing for this kind of use. Um, it's just the sort of thing that makes your heart clutch when you first see it. Um, we have also looked at figuring out how to retire the capital debt that would go into building this and, and 
but doing a gut check against how other similar sized places perform, we are right in line. So what would the debt retirement look like? Um, we're talking, I think I lost a slide here, and I may have gone over it too fast. Um, the, the, we also looked at all the, a range of capital costs and how to, how to, how to deal with those, the, which is about 25 to 39. Um, the convention centers are typically publicly financed. They're retired over 20 or 30 years. Often, as I mentioned, tax revenues from a whole different kinds of sources. Um, it will come as no, no surprise to you that most places try to figure out how to get the visitors to pay for the convention center. So um, it tends to be overly loaded on, on things like life hotel taxes and that kind of thing so that the um, benefits accrue to the local uh, population without the, without the taxes doing the same. People bond for them in, in using all of the different types of instruments that are available, general obligation, revenue secure bonds, and so forth. Um, some places have funded their convention centers with tax improvement finance districts. That can be risky if the, um, if the anticipated uh, revenues do not appear. Um, others have helped finance them by essentially um, accumulating more land than needed um, so that they capture the development values that they're creating on the adjacent lands. Um, others work with developers to put together a whole package and essentially have a, a lease financing deal. Certificates of participation are a different way of, of dealing with bonds, more like almost like a stock instrument, um, selling naming rights. Whatever you do here is something that's going to take a while to figure out, but will probably be absolutely unique and tailored to your circumstances here. And that's very important. It's very important that you as a community feel comfortable if you pursue this in um, how you organize that as well. And I will speed up. The Iron Temple. You all know it as the Moorish Revival signature structure for the area. And it's, um, for many years, people have, have gone there for their celebrations and their ceremonies. But times have changed and it's no longer needed for, it's the, 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 the shrine is no longer needed and they have now offered it up for civic use, which is a huge opportunity. It's about 32,000 square feet, and what's important is that um, close to 10,000 square feet of that is in the basement, because for running a convention center, there's an awful lot of back of house space that's needed for, for the storing of tables and chairs, and for the catering kitchen, and so forth. And it's very nice that there's already a tucked away space with decent ceiling height for this to happen. Um, the other thing that the Iron Temple has, which is uh, tremendous, is the fly tower and stage. That, that you don't have to reinvest in creating that kind of space for events. It's, it's just terrific. Um, the reason to incorporate the iron are many. I think some of the most important ones are that your versatility is vastly increased. It gives you an additional flat floor space that allows you to compete for the larger events, but it also allows you to have two events at once, to have a community event that's going on at the same time as something with a larger audience, and to um, have intimate events that just need a small space that would feel lost in a large convention center. So it's um, exceedingly useful on a number of physical levels, but it's also exceedingly useful um, in other ways. It would be very nice for the community, everybody here who has memories of having gone to graduations or um, att attended banquets there, to have that back. It's, um, and even more, even more important from the perspective of the convention center than that, it would make this an absolutely memorable and distinctive place. Because as you go through your, your career, you attend conferences in other cities, how many convention centers do you actually remember? You may remember the events, but you don't remember the space that most of them are in big boring vanilla boxes. You would not have a big boring vanilla box with a river out in front and, a, and, and, and that temple um, in, 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 as your marquee location. It is a major undertaking. It needs work. It needs a rope. It needs an elevator. Um, when you're dealing with that kind of tile work, it can get expensive. Um, you should not be surprised when some of those numbers start coming in higher than you thought um, because it is a one-of-a-kind thing. So there might be some ways to mitigate that, though. And one of them would be coming up with some sort of creative ownership structure that allows you to take advantage of the national tax credits that National Historic Tax Credits that would be available. You can um, syndicate those, you can um, trade them off to the developer for something else you want. And if Pennsylvania comes forward with a parallel program, the value of that benefit will be even greater. The Iron Temple, in terms of a forum for it, is tricky because 
the, um, there are definitely costs associated with it, and we were using as a thumbnail estimate right now about 100,000 for the uh, HDAC, about 50 for everything else. But most of the costs of running this adjunct to the convention center are already accounted for in the programmers for the convention center. In our um, depiction of staffing and marketing and, and, and operations and maintenance costs, because it's not incrementally, it's not proportionally more expensive to have this incremental space. But still, we think that by adding this on, apart from the capital cost of renovation, we should count on roughly another 100,000 um, in, 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 in operating funds that need to be supported elsewhere. The headquarters hotel is an absolute requirement, and it should have a national flag, it should be, um, it should have room blocking arrangement, it should be a seamless interface between the convention center and this, such that it complements your existing downtown stock. It's great that you can give people the choice of several downtown places to stay that are just within a couple of minute walk. Because right now, most of your inventory is somewhere else. Most of your inventory in Wilkes Barre is the 1,500 rooms. Most of them are out by the arena or somewhere else. Um, there's 3,000 rooms in Luzerne County. But when you're at a conference, you want to be able to bump into people at the bar. You want to be able to just sort of randomly meet people <coughs> that you know and randomly see. If you're going to be staying at a less expensive part of our location, you want to make that choice and not have it thrust behind you, which is why you need to have a headquarters hotel right there. So in Wilkes-Barre right now, what you've got is um, a lot of homogeneity among the offerings. And so there's a lot available for, for people at one segment of the target market and not a lot available at others. These are occupancy rates over time, this goes to 2004. You can see um, you, you can see a little bit of, of decline in occupancy rate, but meanwhile your supply has also been going up. Um, this is room rates. Same kind of story, dropped after September 11th, right? September will be here. <coughs> um, dropped after se September 11th, but it's coming back and is, um, is, is, is pretty healthy. That at your summer peak last summer, you were hitting um, an average of about, um, hard to see, 125 a room. And last night I made 132 with the home garden. So it's, it's not as low as people think. <coughs> what we're talking about here is 250 rooms, um, a restaurant, and as a full service hotel, it would have things like a business center, a concierge, and it would have you know, good internet access. And it might, if there's room, be able to have some of its own meeting space that it controlled that was separate from the convention center itself. So looking at hotels in terms of what kind of investment might be justified, hotels are, um, are pretty well understood, and a typical break even is roughly 67%. Looking at that events calendar that was developed for the convention center, where we had the whole thing of different kinds of events, different times of year, how many people, and so forth, if, and what percentage of those people are staying on the night, as opposed to people who are just coming locally, if they got half of it, half the potential that they could have for that price point of those more, of the people who are coming to those events in the hypothetical event calendar, they would be almost halfway <coughs> to solvency. And when we projected it out looking at pictures of demand, we um, managed to, we found other sufficient demand that would drive it up to, to that order of 66, 67, 68% occupancy within the four or five year period because its ramp up period is going to follow the convention centers because it's going to have to be able to block rooms that go with those events and so forth. So what does that work out to? Well, we started at 139, which is probably low, but again, this goes to the thing about being conservative in projections. And what, when you back into it, that works out to about $32.5 million, which equates to $130,000 a room, but that's low. That's low for the industry, which is typically spending $140,000 to $175,000 per room. So how can you fill that gap? You should know that that gap does not reflect what we have in the physical plan guaranteed, which is the monopoly on the food service and all the revenues that are associated with that. So starting looking at other ways to either reduce construction costs or the cost of financing or increasing operating revenues and, uh, and decreasing operating expenditures. The two key things that really stand out as a way to give the hotel more revenues when it's operating and thus justify the level of per room investment that's needed to make a convention center caliber hotel are looking at the food service guarantees and shared management. We can play around with construction 
um, by messing around with how the hotel parking is financed or the land acquisition and so forth. But from an operating standpoint, the keys are going to be the food service and the management. Because what makes the most sense here is going to be some kind of agreement that makes the, the um, oversight of the hotel and the convention center property extremely tight and interlaced. And it might be that the hotel company manages both, or it might be that it's a franchise um, operation that is separating the property from the identity of the flag that's traveling with. But in any event, they have to be absolutely seamless in their oversight because all this coordination is necessary to ensure financial performance for each partner. The parking demand on this property is closely linked with what City Best needs for it itself. Fitting about 600 spaces into that, I mean, sorry, all demand together totals about 600 spaces, and 200 of that is accounted for by City Best as of our most recent conversation with that. A parking garage sliding it into that slot on the, on the, um, on the site would cost somewhere between nine and twelve million dollars to be determined because we don't know certain things yet about about the soils and so forth. Four million of it is understood where it's coming from, leaving three to six. Um, something is not right here. Um, it seems to me that it would be more like like um, five to eight rather than three to six. So I think I think we have a typo in the slide here. Um, what it works out to, though, is that, oh, I know this. It's not, you know, the four million, if there's more than four million identified, because I forgot about the, uh, sorry, I just had, a, I had one of those brief um, brain spasms that you sometimes, sometimes get when you're making presentations and, and um, <coughs> you've been talking too long. So I'll try to cure that by stopping soon. <laughs> um, there are at least three to six million dollars left uh, unidentified. There's an additional two million that's not reflected here because it's a different category of funding. And what that means is that the revenue generating spaces would have to each deliver between $1,000 and $1,600 a year in order to make the parking garage pass that. If they can do better than that, then the parking garage might be throwing off cash, which could be applied to the operating deficits of the rest of the complex. That remains to be seen. I've enjoyed coming here. I've enjoyed making this presentation. And I've enjoyed my trips to Wilkes Barre because the longer I spend time here, um, the more I'm inspired by, by the people and the place and their impact upon each other. I am hopeful that regardless of what you all choose to do with this, that it's been useful to you. And I know that Susquehanna Landing, in whatever shape it comes, is, is going to just deliver all sorts of benefits to the, to the city of Rosebury. Um, Mary's going to talk a little bit about the Discovery Center and how that ties into all of this as a benefit to both the convention center, the um, hotel operation, their, the combined experience of being there, and the city and surrounding community as a whole. Thanks. I think we're going to come back to a full circle on it. Um, you can see that um, in this scenario, the Iron Temple has um, a, a really a very appropriate use incorporated into kind of coming back to where it started as an assembly space, a really unique one. Uh, the Discovery Center is something that kind of emerged from the idea originally of can, can we bring people, uh, visitors, to downtown Wilkes-Barre. And as we looked at it, it was more also about adding vibrancy to the downtown here among the, the attractions that you're trying to get as well as for like a number of communities is trying to make its downtown a little bit cooler and more attractive. Um, we discovered in the course of our conversations with many of you, and some of them very probing, sometimes kind of painful conversations. I'll never forget how many times we were told, don't talk about coal. Either it's going to be just too controversial to talk about anthracite, because either you were on this side of it and were an oppressor, or you were on this side of it and you were oppressed, and it's just something that is there. But what we really learned, I think, a lot was people were really ready to examine the, 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 what, was, what meant the underlying values under that. And a lot of people were really ready to take on something that would be very significant in terms of um, a facility to tell some of these stories. We also found a great deal of interest uh, on the part, particularly a lot of the educational uh, institutions, in um, science and, and nature uh, facility. Uh, so we've had very productive conversations with a number of the key institutions and players in all of this. 
The uh, Discovery Center um, cultural attractions, which we're envisioning as oriented around history or and heritage of uh, the story of the area and also around the nature of the area, have now been relocated from the IRA to a building that's already right there and have been studied once before as a potential site for an art museum. Um, you, some of you may remember it as the old um, Elks building. That's the postcard image of it behind. It's the annex to the, to the Sterling. Uh, it has about 24,000 square feet. I'll show you in a moment. It's four stories high. It has very high ceilings in it. Uh, and it's also able to be broken up in a way uh, that would work for different themes, different galleries, different kinds of experiences. Now, what is a visitor? And by visitor, I mean you, your families, the folks who come uh, for family events here, as well as uh, tourists. What are you going to experience when you go there? Well, these days, people have pretty high expectations. And history museums and nature museums are not your father's Oldsmobile. They're exciting and interesting places to go. Any of you have been to a convention in Pittsburgh have probably gone to a pre-event um, some reception or something at the Heinz History Center there. And that's kind of one of those examples. Now, I bet there isn't anybody in the area with kids or grandkids who hasn't uh, taken them to the Franklin uh, Institute recently for the very exciting experience of being there. It's very dynamic. It's a place for a lot of learning to take place. And what we're thinking here is something that can deal with both history and nature because they come together here in, uh, in, what's part, in, a, in a highly unusual way. Uh, so those are all the kind of audiences that will be designed for. Thanks to Jim Bell and his crew, we've been able to take this building and kind of blow it apart and look at how visitor flow might work in it to make sure that worked well. Uh, it's really going to be fairly okay to have public and exhibit space on multiple levels. Uh, there's plenty of room for office and administration. There's a potential for very good vertical and horizontal circulation, and, uh, and, the, and the circulation is, is really quite excellent. We're feeling that, that really um, some of the conversations that we've had with those of you who've lived here for many years when we talk about the stories and the importance of getting them out for yourselves, for young people, for a generation of people who are associated with an important industry who are, are in their uh, last years and it's going to be difficult to get their stories captured. It's really important. And also that this is a kind of a missing narrative. What is it? Um, Schomer's willing, um, kind of listen to many of you. And one of the great things about Schomer is he can listen and then tell you back what you didn't say, but what you may have meant. And what we were, what had really emerged and what was beginning to resonate was uh, in, that this was a place that was built by folks who really chose to come here against great, uh, uh, great challenges. They came here and sacrificed tremendously, uh, living for, really for the next generation. And in the process of their sacrifices, their hard work, their very dangerous work, their work that didn't have much social standing in some regards, they built a better life not only for their families, but for all Americans through the contributions that this region has made to the Industrial Revolution and the might and power of, of, the, of the nation we call home. At the same time, another major story here has to do with your location on the Susquehanna River. It's a great opportunity, using the river right outside the door, to be able to talk about and, and demonstrate and let kids participate in, families participate in, learning about the nature of the really shaped place. And when those two overlapped, as they could in very exciting ways um, in 1973 particularly, um, you, you, had, you, you actually made history. So the visitor experience in going into uh, the Sterling Annex, the old Elks building, transformed into a discovery center, would begin with a lively film that kind of gave you the overall uh, picture of it. Uh, you probably need to put that into dramatic spaces of being able to see giant artifacts like the large fan from the Durrance um, uh, mine, among other, uh, among other things. And there might really be opportunities for touch tanks and things where you can learn really by feeling and doing and experience some of the, uh, the river itself. And coming out of that, probably an interactive 3D uh, depiction of the river and, and the watershed. Um, these days, when you go to um, modern museums, there are a lot of immersive experiences where you really kind of are in the middle of it and you learn a lot about the, the lives of the people who uh, created this area and created a lot of what our country takes for granted now and how the different cultures um, 
kind of have different rituals or the same stages of life, but they have different importance in different cultures. And those kinds of things might really be enriched here. Uh, and finally, we're thinking that it would be marvelous to bring the kind of final effect of the experience of the Discovery Center, bringing history and nature together with the location of Wilkes Barre, uh, and al allow people to actually immerse themselves in an exhibit that would be the sound and fury uh, and experience of Herbie Agnes, and talking about the amazing rebuilding and the amazing pulling together of the community that, that helped you recover from that, and that is now uh, you know, transformed its riverfront partly as a result of it. Um, all of the, develop, the, the facility for the Discovery Center, the really feeling is something that, um, in some ways, is based on the great success you've had at the arena, is in partnership uh, with, we're hoping, a new nonprofit um, to work with the chamber on developing the building and the shell, and then uh, for the nonprofit to operate the facilities in, inside the, uh, the visitor experience in the museum themselves. Potential partners for this, and we talked to virtually all of you about this at one point or another. There's been a lot of expression of interest on the part of some of the educational institutions in particular are reaching out um, beyond just the, the downtown arena here with the, the other colleges and higher ed facilities as well. Um, this is a building that um, is right there, and it's uh, already in a state of acquisition, so we don't have to factor into a uh, cost for that. It's going to take some money to bring it back. Anybody who's seen it lately knows that it, it needs some TLC. The exhibits uh, here have a fairly a significant price tag, and I wanted to explain that for a little bit. We're really feeling that to attract uh, folks from beyond the region to make it more than just a, a, a Wilkes Bar experience, this really needs to be a first-rate, exciting experience uh, of kind of the caliber of the, of the things you see at Franklin and the Franklin Institute and others. So those are, they're, they're, um, it's a more than an unusually um, high investment in the exhibits, but we've also felt that they needed to be made as capital investment to have much lower operating expenses, and it's also usually easier to get capital projects uh, funded as well. In addition, there's a little bit of pre-development there for the fundraising and architectural fees. So the Discovery Center has a price tag of somewhere between $8 and $10 million to have it operational. Um, I mentioned that we, we tend to be, and Elaine has confirmed that we tend to be fairly conservative in our estimates of what the, uh, this, this is not going to be something that's going to have 400,000 people a year coming to it. It's going to have, for people who come here for its own reason, uh, rather relatively modest. But think of it in terms of its relationship to the rest of the Susquehanna River Landing facility um, with, and the opportunity for special events and things there, and it has uh, much greater synergy. Um, by the fifth year, the stabilization of visitor and income predictable for the visitors uh, will, we hope, have taken place. Uh, it still is going to mean that, like most cultural facilities, uh, even the, the Philadelphia Museum of Art and others, have a capital, or rather, a, a, an annual giving and membership campaign to raise some of the, the funds necessary for the programming. Um, the uh, estimates for this facility are well within the typical operating scenarios for museums and cultural facilities um, around the country that we know of. And again, it could be one of those things that really makes the experience of coming to Wilkes Barre or being downtown uh, quite, uh, quite a, a, a bit above some of the others. Um, how, one, how might one operate this? If, and when I'm speaking of this, we're really not speaking of just the Discovery Center. We're speaking of of um, operating the rest of it. And what, what one might do is uh, have an existing governmental body do it. You have a stadium, I believe, that's operated that way. You could form a, a, a semi-autonomous group <coughs> and use an existing authority, or one could do as has happened at the, fairly successfully at the arena and use a management company. Uh, or there could be a mix of, of any of these to do that. Um, there might even be some, some um, opportunities for having a management company handle the physical facility operations of the museum facility um, so that the, the operations on the cultural side of it, the programming, would be the nonprofit organization and get some cost savings in it that way. I guess the main thing we wanted to say is we really think that there are, um, are, are ways of, of sort of crossing <coughs> over and undercutting or rather un uh, using the synergy of, of the location of all of these to really um, um, make it a much more efficient operation. Um, with this, we're really ready to open it up to discussion, observation, uh, 
or whatever. I'm going to turn it back to Steve because I think we're going to moderate this portion of it. I think now you might have an appreciation of why this, this effort has taken as long to really put together. Uh, we've had a number of, of moving parts to this, and we'll continue to see uh, moving parts as, as we proceed forward. But I think this gives you an opportunity of, of, of what we can really do in this community. Uh, we talk about legacy projects. Uh, the arena is a legacy project. The riverfront will be a legacy project. But what are we doing with them to really build, to take it to the next level? Uh, we've talked, a lot of us have talked about how, how we want this community to be one of the nicest small cities on the East Coast. Well, this is part of it. You know, we need to take a look at, at bringing people here and showing them what we have. Uh, Kevin, Tom, and we, we had the discussion a long time ago. Folks say, why isn't the arena in downtown? You know, it, should be, it should be there instead of putting it up in the township. Well, there's a difference. There's a distinction here when we talk about a convention center. Because convention centers attract people for multiple day stays. Uh, the arena is, is, is an entity unto itself and does a lot of good things. Uh, but generally, you know, people aren't staying for multiple days. Uh, this has a particular advantage to a downtown location. And then you might also have heard out there that there's other convention centers in northeastern Pennsylvania, the, the Hilton Scranton Convention Center. Well, now when you get to the topic of, of public assembly facilities, uh, that is more of a conference center. It's, 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 it's a hotel with, with conference facilities with, with a high state of technology attached to it. This is a different animal. So, so not to be confused with, with what's out there at the present time. The economics for this also, in a lot of ways, resembles a lot of the, the economics for the arena project from the standpoint of the market and where our service area would be. When we started looking at this, it was remarkable to see that we really don't, there isn't a lot of competition in the northeast quadrant of the state for these types of facilities. So it was a natural for us to take a look and, and, and see what we can do and, and take a look at really creating the entire package uh, for this community. Now, what you saw and what was presented today was really only a tip of the iceberg in terms of the level of work that was put into this project by all the consultants here. Uh, you know, we, have, we have a document that's about this thick, you know, packed with numbers and all sorts of things uh, for us to take a look at as we proceed. And, and you know, just today, just getting a cursory review of, of the work that was done took enough time. So we do appreciate you all coming today. Uh, but I'm sure you have some thoughts or some questions uh, that you may want to pose to the consultants while we have them here. You know, while they're still on the slot, uh, it might be good that we ask them uh, you know, some, some, some questions or provide some comments. So let's open it up. And Larry's also here. If you have if you want to ask Larry something. So go ahead. Sue. I just think it's tremendously exciting, and I just want to commend you to work on this for having the courage to dream? Well, in spite of our past history, <laughs> you know, uh, you know the, there's, a, there's a lot of people in this room that aren't afraid to dream as to what it can be. And uh, thank you. I think I have a question. What's the priority of the building? Obviously, the convention center, you would think you would want the amenities in place first in order to attract conventions. So, would the well, convention well, center well, last well, or well, first? Well, no, let's go to the It's interesting because the hurdles for them are, are different. The convention and the hotel have to be lined up hand in hand. You can't, there's not really a justifiable reason for building one without the other. Um, although, uh, the hurdle on the Discovery Center is an organization in place that's willing to take it on and sustain it through. And the beginnings of that are in place. Um, I would say that the Iron Temple is probably, it could be, is also dependent upon the convention center for the use that's identified for it here. 
if it was desirable to the community to just have it as a, as a, as a community serving use that could be handled independently. But its feasibility is greatly positively affected by being able to play off the convention center trade. So to return to your question in terms of order, I would say convention center and hotel must go together. Iron could follow, but it would be better for the, um, and Jim Bell may want to address this, it would be better for the, for the uh, connectivity of it to have it planned ahead of time how they would eventually be linked. Um, and the, the uh, cultural center could also follow, but I agree with you, it would be nice if it was also there in place. It could exist in the town. Life's not linear, yeah, right. so some of it may respond to opportunity as well. If the head of steam really gets um, formed around the cultural facility and that was moving ahead, it isn't going to stop or, um, or hold off or anything, some of the other components as well. But I think Elaine is absolutely right about the need for the convention center and the hotel to be locked in. I'll never forget when you and I were doing a project in Akron, Ohio, uh, shortly after their, they call it a civic center because the state doesn't fund convention centers um, and they have gotten a fairly large chunk of state money for this. But they had built one about this size and nothing was happening. And one of the reasons being that a number of the folks when asked to help finance the hotel had said there are plenty of hotel rooms in Cuyahoga Falls and it's only a 10 minute cab ride away. Every meeting planner who called went, where are the hotel rooms? Oh, they're only a 10 minute, and that was the last they heard of the meeting planners. So the, the two of those really do need to go together. Well, unfortunately, too, the parking is off on the mm -hmm. oh, yeah. legs of the dog. But the it come first. The, the parking is obviously something you address, but bus, truck, automobile traffic on Market Street and Franklin, have we ever discussed that? That's come on yeah. throughout our alternatives analysis. We have been looking at truck bays and how to accommodate them since day one. Um, is it of interest to the group to hear a little bit about that? Or is well, it if you sat on Franklin, I, we really don't have rush hours, but you could sit on Franklin for a period of time today. Yeah. And looking at what you have, I just look at the narrowness of the streets and the one way. I give directions constantly how to get to the square. And that's from people coming across uh, from Kingston. They just can't get there with the streets and the way they are now. I'm trying to think of someone who is from out of the area maneuvering in that area that you've identified. I think it's great to have it condensed the way it is, but you've got to be able to drive through it. That's hilarious. Can I, can I just, let me just jump in on that. I think what you're, what you're talking about, Lou, is addressed or begins to be addressed in part by the increasing interrelationship between what happens at the Hotel Sterling site and what happens on other parts of the block. Because I think one of the interesting things that I saw when I looked at the different schemes that were developed by the architectural firms for CityVest is that you started to see some new solutions to dealing with the servicing issue that would not only benefit the Sterling complex itself, but which also started to untie that knot you're talking about in terms of how you actually deal with servicing other things that might occur on that block. And I think that's true of the different, you know, all of the different schemes that, that you know, were on display at the Oscar Cup. Um, so, you know, that's, that's where, really where I think that issue needs to get uh, more of a focus. Is, is, is these guys start to move forward and we start looking and, and seeing how that, it, it, all, it all gets tied together, inevitably. But I think that's part of the solution. Does the City Best project have um, a hotel component? Sorry, what? There's a hotel, the major national chain hotel that you're talking about here. But the City Best project itself also has a hotel component. Don't look at me. <laughs> well, we, uh, uh, we, depending upon the demand for the mixed use uh, on the corner building, that will help drive the decision of the tower. And what we uh, provided for at this early stage is a new building on the tower site that could be all hotel, part hotel, uh, part housing, some 
mix. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's a contemplated boost. I think it would be fair to say that those schematics that um, BCJ put together for us were trying to prove that the hotel could fit somewhere else in case City Best decided to pursue a different development option for their parcel. Yes, there was an early, there have been several earlier versions that showed a hotel on that site. Understand that the, through the magic of computers, these are, are visualizations that are really showing how things can fit, including truck turning radiuses and everything else, can fit on that site. It isn't to say that that's exactly where they might end up, although the Irem and the Sterling Annex are very likely to stay exactly where they are along with the Sterling Hotel. Yeah, what, what we try to do in this entire process, and, I mean, and this whole effort is really try to stimulate your imagination in terms of what we can do. We didn't want to necessarily put this idea out there unless we had some support for it from a factual standpoint and an analysis standpoint. All right, you've heard it today. And, and now we really need to think about this. There's a lot of wonderful initiatives that are going on in the city at the present time. Uh, Sterling being one of the one of those most significant, along with the theater complex and everything that's going to happen in between. Uh, this this concept is something that, quite frankly, we need to seriously you know, give it some thought if, if we really are looking at taking this community to the next level. Uh, how, how many times have have many of you traveled to a different city and? attended a conference or, or some type of meeting and visit this place and say, gee, I wouldn't mind having a house here. Uh, and South Carolina and North Carolina are huge beneficiaries of that. Uh, and we'd like to have that same kind of mentality if you came and visited Wilkes-Barre and said, well, this would be a bad place to live. Because that indirectly has a bearing on corporate business decisions. Uh, your ability to attract new employees to work in your current operations, and a whole host of, of other quality of life issues. The Chamber of Business and Industry, when we had a, a retreat over the past year, decided we have two primary goals for the organization. Uh, one is the job creation and retention uh, of, of just the basic economy of this community, and the other was to enhance the quality of life, thinking that those two are this day and age are, are really intertwined. And, uh, and the purpose of this effort here was really taking a look at, at that quality of life aspect of it uh, and tying some serious economics to it as well. So I know we have, uh, we have a few here. I know we have uh, uh, Representative Blum, Senator Lamont. I mean, we're not asking for any formal commitments. So we're, just, we're just putting the idea out there. But do you have any thoughts, Kevin or Senator? Yes, you asked what do we think. Uh, we think fantastic. It was well worth waiting for. Ladies, that was as good a presentation as we've had on almost anything, uh, either in Harrisburg or Wilkesburg in a long time. You've seen our Harrisburg presentation? <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you see this one in Harrisburg. <laughs> if, if you have anything to do with what's happened in Harrisburg, you've made that a place that people want to go to or come to. And if you can do that here, that's that's the vision that Steve and the others in the room have been talking about. And thank you for uh, you know, for what you did this afternoon over the past five years. But thank you. <laughs> Uh, let me agree with Senator Lamont that uh, I think this was impressive. Uh, I think the arena showed that this community has the ability to do the big projects. I think that gives us courage to do the theaters and, <clears throat> and with Judd and his team uh, to, to uh, re, uh, rebuild and, and bring back life to the Sterling. Uh, I would like to say, I wonder about the dam. I think that the playable dam is an important part of, of bringing back the river. And uh, uh, I think this is the next uh, goal for our community, uh, as, uh, and maybe the last piece, you know, with, with the arena and what that can do uh, with the theaters and, and what it will do on that side of downtown, bringing back to Sterling and not doing something with the riverfront. So I think it's very exciting. Thank you. You know, another person, Tom Mikowski, who was who had a profound impact in terms of moving a lot of the riverfront activities. Uh, Ford and the levy system and on the, on the part of Luzerne County. Uh, you know, given your position now of being once removed from public office, uh, you know, you're not known to be silent on a lot of things. By the way, I was voluntarily removed from public office. So. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs>
said years ago, which I still, it still rings my ear, I told Kevin about it before, and I think it's absolutely true. It's one of the best things I've ever heard about the downtown, and again, it still deals with, if you don't have people living down there, you're not going to be able to, to sustain what we really want out of this thing. So, I mean, this, I think, could be a catalyst for condos, houses, something, to get people to be living down there, so you get that flow and that general stream of people. And the other thing is the college town idea, getting Kings and Wilkes together, uh, to, to really work with the, with each other to make this entity really, I think, see its, you know, its final you know, resolution is, is really the key. The college town idea of getting people to live in this, along with the riverfront, Steve, I think will be uh, the thing that will change everything downtown. And I really love all the ideas. We have a little bit of reservation about the uh, museum because we just don't, I mean, there's just so many things about this area that are unique, you know that. Uh, I don't know where that, that goes or what you do with it, but other than that, I like everything else very, very much. And I think, I think the RNES uh, episode would be an interesting part of the museum. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like I, just, I just maybe ask our consultants. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of uh, the inflatable dam. Uh, I believe that creating uh, something three times, four times bigger than Harvey's Lake in downtown Wolfsbury. Uh, is, is such a wonderful idea and, and everything that will come from that. Uh, where do you see that fitting in and how essential do you believe it is and or, or is it essential here? I think it's great. I, I remember talking to Jim Rosina about this 10 years ago and I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard <laughs> because of what it was going to do for um, recreational opportunities and, and, and scenic amenities and um, just how it was going to change the character of downtown. It's, um, it is a, a, a key contributor. I think all of this would work without it, um, but I think it's a key contributor. Now there's, there's also a couple other people that need to be acknowledged. Alan Sachs is here from the Delaware Lehigh Heritage Board or Commission. And, and Alan has, has been with us from the beginning on this project. He's one of the unsung heroes in really trying to push this whole agenda forward from the standpoint. Now, it, Gentle persuasion, uh, you know, dollars to help us proceed with this effort. When I talked about the, the cost for doing this project before. I mean, that involves some, some state dollars, involves federal dollars, involves county dollars, and, and the chamber taking some, some money as well. So it's really been a collaborative effort from all levels of government to allow us to do this kind of planning. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a lot of accolades that need to be out there. Also, I'd like to acknowledge Shelley Pierce. Uh, who's here today representing uh, Team Gilmore. Now she's leading an effort uh, to, to create a, 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 an art center uh, to take a look at visual and performing arts. Uh, and you know, we've, we were working collaboratively with them in terms of trying to identify where there's a lot of commonality <coughs> what we're attempting to do here and how we can be helpful to each other. Um, so that, this is really thank you for coming. Our chairman. Doug, you have a question? Um, trying to be practical, um, do we have any sources of funding to expect? Because really, it should be mostly there should be the parking, the access roads, and so on. My, my feeling is that the hotel will be a consequence and not a leader because the hotel companies don't need charge a follow. Uh, and I think that it will definitely be resolved to a separate structure or part of the second phase of, of Sterling. Uh, if the museum, uh, if the convention center moves forward and there's funding for that and for the park. I think every convention is practical. Yeah. No, 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 the convention center brings hotels and then we can change to be there. I doubt that we would have a whole power of hotel rooms, the most probably maybe half a dozen floors of hotel rooms and the condominiums above it. Uh, it could be, uh, I agree with Tomikowski that um, if you don't have individuals who own the homes, uh, 
for the Wyoming Valley, things will not work. We need voters, we need taxpayers, we need the Now we're hoping, we're hoping that, that you are so successful with uh, Philly and Sterling and the second building early in the game that uh, and, uh, we'll have, uh, at least we'll have some backup options for the hotel center. Just well, it will be nice if you announce the um, funding for the convention center. I think that would help. I believe the first phase is sort of pre-sold in the minds of many people because of the desire of some people to sell their homes and move downtown and so on and so forth. But, with, but that, that's not going to, that will not define success. Success will be whether the second phase is well, every convention center in Pennsylvania has had gubernatorial support. I mean, if in fact, it, it doesn't, it's, that was, I would say it would stand a snowball's chance in hell of ever being funded if you didn't have the support of the governor against some portion of the capital cost. That's probably true all over the country, not just in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And uh, so, well, we're not really prepared to get into that kind of a discussion at this right. point. We just really wanted to put it out there because we haven't, we haven't really sat down and how it come up with a financial management plan. Probably one thing that if, if, if the intent is on behalf of the board and our, and our elected leaders to proceed with this, then we ought to go out and commission another effort to do a more detailed financial analysis of this project. Now, how can we skin this cat in terms of getting it funded and then moving it forward? Uh, but, but we have something good to start with, and uh, hopefully we can, we can build on that uh, over the coming months. Uh, Bob? I have a question for Elaine. Um, first of all, congratulations on, on your presentation. I had the privilege of reading all 85 pages on the building. <laughs> and it's very detailed, very complex, and you did one whole job of impressing it. The only two areas that concern me today, you mentioned that the market is not typically elastic. Yes. And, and there's a question concerning timing, and I, I didn't get a sense of what the limits are on that timing and how elasticity affects our, our schedule. Um, what I mean by the market not being infinitely elastic is that um, the number of, of associations and meeting is not, meetings are not expanding in parallel with population. And it remains to be seen, I have not yet analyzed it, what the changing character of the demographics of Pennsylvania and its organization may portend for ongoing demand for different kinds of events. And meetings. The other piece of that elasticity is that um, there are other communities out there who are thinking about building convention centers, and, and and that's the principal thing. That if um, you know if, if five other cities within 50 miles, 50 to 100 miles of here get there first, then then the ship will have sailed. And your other question about timing, um, I think that part of the effort that has to happen with this project, if you decide to go forward, is to stay a claim to that mantle of being the destination for these kinds of events in Northeast Pennsylvania, and to put out there in a strong way your intent, which means marshaling your support and, 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 and going into the further detail of those additional kinds of studies like Steve was going, so that you've got your state of ground so that the other cities that might be contemplating this sort of approach um, Factor you into consideration instead of trying to meet your Okay, We have the privilege of uh, actually doing some work not for the city of Harrisburg but for the state, and uh, because of the new Elm Street program for uh, neighborhoods adjacent to Main Streets and central business districts. So we come in contact a lot with some of the state's uh, policymakers. Um, People have been noticing that things are happening in Wilkes-Barre. And I, I think from a timing standpoint, this is, this, is, this is a time of real reinvestment in Pennsylvania's um, older urban areas, in, particularly in their cores. And this is, I believe, Wilkes-Barre is really being seen as a community that's on the move right now. So in terms of timing, it would be very good to keep that in mind, to take advantage of, of that kind of atmosphere in terms of getting the kind of, of gubernatorial support that is going to be critical here, too. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you very much uh, for everybody coming. Uh, the timing issue is really a 
way, I think, to end the meeting. Um, I think the answer is we have to do it as soon as possible. And in order to do that, uh, we have to uh, establish a firm consensus of the support we have within the community. And I think Steve is probably the best person in the organization to uh, coordinate that, and I would think that's the next step. I would ask if there's any other suggestions regarding the presentation or where we go from here. Uh, other than that, I'd love to welcome. That's it. Thank you very much.